the Center for Court Innovation for inviting me. Uh, thank you for being here. A strange session where you're listening to an architect. You know, what is an architect doing here? Uh, first, I'd like to tell you a little bit about why and, and my organization. Uh, tell you a little journey to how we got here. You know, I always wanted to actually come to this conference. I thought, you know, one day I'm going to go to the Community Courts Conference, and now here I am, and I'm actually speaking at it, which feels amazing. Uh, I do have an architecture and real estate development nonprofit, and our mission is to use our innovations in architecture and the built environment to develop new tools, new building types, new spaces that address the root causes of mass incarceration. So we support restorative justice, restorative economics, and we do not design prisons or jails or courthouses. We do not do that infrastructure. We support diversion and reentry. And so we'll talk a little bit about some of that. I'd like to tell you the journey on our, our how we got here, starting with, I hope you don't mind something a little, a little personal. So uh, my journey around thinking about issues of equity and justice began when I was quite young, uh, when I was five, and my family desegregated a community, very rural, all-white community in Virginia. Uh, and it was a time of sort of fear and confusion around the sort of hatred that we were experiencing and starting to understand at a very young age that a lot of the systems that we were operating in were inequitable and unfair. And there was one in particular that my father told us about. He's like, one system you never want to be in is the criminal justice system. You never want to find yourself in a courtroom, ever, not even for divorce. Like, it was a hard line in the sand. And so I became scared of justice. I became scared of this building. I'd never been in this building. It was a Stafford County Courthouse, never stepped foot in it. Uh, and I bec became aware that perhaps this system was not fair to people of color. At least that's what my father absolutely told me, and it became to be some of my experiences later in life. And so my reaction to that was to build my own little structures, right? So I was building space to comfort myself within the context of the environment that I was in. It was a very simple, natural thing to do, to build these little huts in the woods and sit there day in, day out. And so it was not a surprise to my family when I went to architecture school. And this is what we were doing in architecture school. We were making blobs. No one talked about people. No one talked about places. It was all about form making. And so when I, I started to have these early ideas that, you know, architects could make change. You know, we could be helping people. I was at School Columbia, Harlem was down the road, and I was told I was in the wrong place because this is what we were doing there. So a little confused, but I finished and I went on into a professional career uh, designing shopping centers. So, you know, I was left overseas, you know, shopping centers with real estate developers, big projects. Uh, in England, I worked in the Middle East. I worked in China, was starting to understand at least more about how architecture and culture related to each other. So I wasn't that into the building type, I wasn't that into the shopping, but the cultural aspects. We were starting to talk about people and place. And so that time took about six years, and after working in uh, Australia for some time, in Australasia, I came back to the United States and was doing houses for rich people, uh, office buildings, uh, again, working for developers and institutions, and really starting to wonder and ask myself this question. You know, why am I doing this? What is the purpose of this work? Is it only to work really for the wealthy and the powerful? Uh, I was getting a little tired of it. I, I didn't see a lot of diversity and agency of all people in the built environment. And I also saw that something new was happening. That in architecture, there was something called the public interest design movement. That architects were starting to realize that there was a role for us to play in addressing systemic change and addressing social inequities. Uh, groups like Architecture for Humanity and Public Architecture. And for the first time, I was like, I said to myself, this is how I want to practice. This is where we really need to be headed. And there were very few people thinking about and doing this. And what I decided was to completely disobey my father. And I went back right into the system. I was told never, ever to go near. And I started to look at criminal justice and what was happening there. Uh, and I think I learned and was actually surprised at something that we probably all know, that we were incarcerating more of our citizens than any country in the world. Uh, it was disturbing to me, but there was something that was equally as disturbing, but familiar, was that it was impacting people of color in grossly disproportionate ways. And that we were investing in the criminal justice system rather than in people and in communities. And I was unsure about really how to intervene in this. 
You know, like I'm an architect. What were architects doing? How were we supporting the system? And what we were doing was designing and developing the infrastructure that supported that system, the development of, of um, detention centers and jails and prisons. I included courthouses within the, the spectrum of that, uh, trying to make them better, trying to make them different. We were also uh, not following other professions in our code of ethics. Uh, doctors had a code of ethics around uh, the injection of poisons uh, for those who are facing the death penalty. Architects had no such uh, code of ethics, so it was very hard to imagine how I could intervene in this, other than making prettier versions of these things. And then I heard about a different justice system. I heard about restorative justice. And I know there was a session yesterday, but I'm curious about who knows restorative justice. If you could just raise your hand, just get a sense in the room. There's quite a few of you. I'm going to do a little, I was told to do a little definition anyway, but in my meaning of it and how I understand it. Uh, and I heard it from lawyers. It was Angela Davis uh, and Fanya Davis, both from, from here, uh, who told me about what restorative justice was. And it was 2006, I'll never forget it. And I, I broke out in these like chill bumps uh, where they told me there was a philosophy that said when a harm had been done, when a crime had been committed, it was a breach of relationship. This was an ancient and old philosophy. And that it was not the needs of the state that were the priority, but the needs of those who'd been harmed. And that those who had committed the offense had an obligation to make amends. They were accountable to repair the breach if possible. And I learned that there were these intense dialogues where they both came together to address the harm. I learned that it was helping produce empathy even in sociopaths. I learned that it was easing PTSD in survivors of the most severe violence. I learned that it could reduce violent reoffending in up to up to 70%. I learned that prosecutors and judges were diverting cases out of court and into restorative justice. And I thought to myself, well, why couldn't I design for this system? How could I amplify this system? How could I design and start to create an infrastructure for restorative justice? And so it was, a, it was a big question, and I honestly, I didn't really know how to do it, but I started to track some people down, and the Center for Court Innovation was one of them. They were one of the first people. I was like, you know, these community courts, they seem restorative. I'm gonna go talk to them. I went to the San Francisco community courts. I flew out to New York. I went to see their community courts. Uh, and I started to track down restorative justice practitioners in my community. I showed up at their conferences. I was super annoying, and they were all confused about why I was there. Um, but then, a miracle, you know, have you ever found like your, your uh, professional soulmate? I kind of found mine. Her name is Dr. Barb Taves. She's a restorative justice practitioner, and she was doing her PhD research on design and restorative justice with incarcerated people, and she was a social worker and a restorative justice practitioner. And so what we did is we teamed up and we started to run the first design studios with incarcerated men and women around the country to explore the intersection of restorative justice and design, given that this population had been on really both sides of the offense and had the most to gain and probably the most knowledge on how do we make these spaces. And we asked them questions like, what kind of environments would you need to be accountable for your actions? What kind of spaces would you need to face the worst thing that you had ever done or the worst thing that had ever been done to you? And we asked this to communities like yourselves as well. And we also taught some basic skills. This was really teaching the basic skills of architecture, model making, perspective drawing. We taught them how to diagram complex spatial relationships. We had people working together in teams for the first time, interviewing correction officers, interviewing each other, so that they could work in teams and communicate their ideas on what these spaces should be. And really their ideas have been brilliant and incredibly informative. This is a Healing Sun Center they created, which was an open, airy center where you have an open circle that faces out with a window at the end and trees integrated into it. We had some students at San Quentin Prison in California create the Restorative Justice Community Center for Wellness and Reconciliation with many spaces for victim offender dialogue, places where you can live and work and share space with the community. They believed that this space uh, really embedded the promise of restorative justice. And so we were doing the great research, creative expression was happening, there was some knowledge building, but then something unexpected for me started to happening, that we were getting therapeutic outcomes from the process. Our students were accessing trauma in our workshops. And so 
part of what we had to do and part of what we were learning was that this is actually a tool for transformation. The, the, the visioning of spaces that are different can do this. And what we were seeing was increased victim empathy from our students. We were seeing increased levels of accountability. We were seeing their capacity to vision an alternative future for themselves. It was very, very powerful work. And so some of that work has been shown at the Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York, and it's traveling around the country now with a 99% with a project about what design can do in our communities. We are going digital with the tool, working with Adovo out of Chicago now that tablets are being brought into the institution. So instead of reaching hundreds of students a year, we can reach tens of thousands of students a year. And so while we have been doing the research, it was time to sort of start building things. Uh, we needed to build these projects. And this was one of my first projects uh, with restorative justice for Oakland youth. They were implementing a program in a high school, a peacemaking program. So instead of suspensions and expulsions, peace students were going into peacemaking. It was just a dirty storage room. It was very simple, simple thoughtfulness around this space. And what happened was that uh, the circles, the program coordinator Yejide said the circles she was having here were more powerful in bringing the community back together after violence, gun violence and fighting in the school. And what was also happening is teachers and students were just coming here because they saw it as a space of refuge for themselves. It was a much needed space in the community. And for us, we were also able to develop a set of design guidelines for creating these restorative spaces in schools. So if any of you are working in schools or know people who do, uh, all of this is on our website and you can share it with them and they can use it as a tool on how to make these spaces. It was also around this time that Aaron called me back. Remember that year gap? He called me and he said, you know, Deanna, uh, we are bringing Native American peacemaking practices into a non-Native community for the first time in Red Hook, and we want to do it in Syracuse, and it'd be great if we could also make a space, as you had suggested. And so we applied for a Burn Justice Innovation Grant. We got it, and uh, the project kicked off in Syracuse, is near West Side, uh, one of the oldest neighborhoods in Syracuse, beautifully rich, diverse community and very low income. And so the first thing that I learned about was the process of how a community court like this or a peacemaking center in this case gets set up. And they were training peace uh, elders in the community to be peacemakers. They were working with uh, the judges and prosecutors, prosecutors to identify cases that would be diverted out of court. And while they were doing that, that sort of program model, I call it, we were doing the place part. So it was a sort of program in place happening at the same time in conjunction with, with one another, which is how we like to work. And so I had done some circle keeper training because I was a little straying outside of the architecture realm at this point in a lot of my work. And we created something called the Peacemaking Palette. And we worked with the community uh, in circle. Right? So it was like I was helping them to train the community on what peacemaking was, but I also got data. Right? I also was able to have people pick an object, a color, an image, and tell me what kind of spaces made them feel at peace. Where would they go? And then they broke into teams to play out those roles as both victim, offender, and community member, telling the story of what it's like to come to a peacemaking center, imagining that, what space is what you need, what would be there. It was an incredible amount of data that we were able to get because I don't, I've never been to a peacemaking center. Has anyone here ever been to one? I've got one. I got a handful. I have a handful. That's great to see even a handful. And hopefully one day it'll be the entire room will raise their hands. But you know, in the meantime, trying to figure out what these places are and what they need to be, this was the way to get there. Another thing that we've learned, and I, I've learned this in a lot of projects, is that we like to centralize stuff. You know, we like to put all the stuff downtown. These are all the resources, especially justice resources. They get clustered. It works well for the lawyers and the judges. Doesn't work so well for the community. It doesn't work so well for restorative justice, which is a hyper-local condition in the way that works. And, you know, I walk this many times. It's less than a mile. But for many people, it's still just too far. It's still too hard. Um, and so we also had to work with the community to locate a space and locate a space on neutral territory where everyone felt comfortable going. And so what we were able to do was find a house that had been started to be uh, adaptively used. It was an old crack house in the community. It was now owned by Syracuse University. And we were able to take this building and turn it into a peacemaking center. And here's, here's what it looks like today. 
Uh, is Lisa here? There she is, yay! Uh, so Lisa is directing this program and they're running, I believe, over 80 circles a year now at this point in the space. Uh, and what she told me, which was great, is that it's sometimes the space itself that's convincing people to engage in peacemaking for the first time. How do we imagine spaces that actually reinforce what we're trying to do and increase its impact? You know, and we feel the space is doing it just like the uh, Castle Mont peacemaking room. It's like the power of space can really amplify what you do. And so these small projects were starting to aggregate and we wanted to do what we could to really evaluate things at a much more macro level. Uh, and I found a document by Prison Fellowships International called RJ City. Do you all know Prison Fellowships International? Has anyone heard of that group? Uh, and they created this paper that said, what would a city need to look like? What would the infrastructure, not the physical infrastructure, but more the programmatic administrative infrastructure look like if we were to make the shift to a completely restorative justice system for an, in a city of a million people? It was very inspiring for me. And I was like, well, what kind of physical infrastructure would we need? And so we got quite serious about that. And with the Institute for the Future, which is a think tank out of Palo Alto, we brought in the Oakland Police Department. We brought in some of the country's leading restorative justice practitioners, the county of Alameda, where Oakland resides, uh, people from juvenile court. We had a room full of people talking about if Oakland were to become the country's first restorative justice city, what would we need to do that? What would it look like? It was a powerful day. And we created a mapping out of that that showed it would be a distributed network of restorative resources through our most low income parts of the city, integrated with housing and with schools. And these little bright lights are restorative justice hubs that would be scattered and integrated throughout the city. We also came up with a series of action domains, areas that we would have to be looking at well beyond criminal justice, looking at environmental justice, food justice, and signals that this was actually already happening. Like I think the community courts conference, what you all are doing, it shows that this is actually the direction that we're starting to head. And some of the models I'd like to just show that we started to see, some you may be familiar with, but we believe that the restorative justice city uses art design in the public realm to restore historical legacies of violence and also violence that happens in the moment. And some of these you may know, the Philadelphia Mural Project, where you have victim and offender groups coming together to create artwork in the community. The Vietnam War Memorial, I think that's a great example of how we can process trauma in the public realm. And the work of Krzysztof Wojcicki, who's a, a, a Polish artist who projects dialogue onto buildings and people are having conversations about severe violence, including in Northern Ireland, Protestants and Catholics, and interviews, and they're starting to have these dialogues in their community, in public, in public places. So imagine that starting to happen more and more. We also believe that the, the co-creation, the re-envisionalization of social services with communities, not a top-down approach, but a bottom-up approach is the way to go. And that design can actually help implement that and reflect that. So one great example are the network opportunity centers, the new and re-envisioning of probation in New York City, where they worked with both urban planners, designers, and architects to locate and design these spaces to mirror a totally different approach on how how they were viewing probationers coming into the space. We also believe that this hybridization of justice, this separating out of our justice and what it looks like is not really as effective as it needs to be. And so we started to look at new hybridized building types, in particular re-entry centers and re-entry campuses. And we are starting to actually do some of these. Uh, the Amity Foundation was an incredible re-entry campus where people are able to come in, go to school, get work, um, and begin to reintegrate and they have housing and come back into their communities and get on their feet. The Reset Foundation, where people are diverted out of jail altogether in a kind of campus style format. So these are sort of the, the infrastructure of the future that we need for the restorative justice city. And I thought Oakland would be the first one, but I think it might be Detroit. Is anybody here from Detroit? Yay, Detroit! We just got some funding from both the Autodesk Foundation and the Skillman Foundation to implement what we call the Restorative Justice City Reinvestment Tool. We will be going to Detroit. We're gathering data both from the community and at the city level on how cities can plan for decarceration, how they can make this shift and reinvest dollars from sort of the criminal justice infrastructure and program they have been and into the communities by identifying a series of um, 
projects, prototypes, tools and things that the community themselves are driving and led and it's a data driven tool. So we kicked that project off and we believe that Detroit could be the first restorative justice city using these kinds of products. So I'm going to return to a building like we, I do generally just do architecture. And those, remember those little lights on that map, those little restorative justice hubs? What came out of that process was a, a project we call Restore Oakland. So we are actually making those things now. And Restore Oakland will be the country's first center for restorative justice and restorative economics. And we are very excited to say, I couldn't say this last time, but we've broken ground and the project is under construction. And what it is, is we're taking this building and we're gutting it. And we're turning it into three things. On the ground floor, we have Restaurant Opportunity Centers United's Colors Restaurant and Chow Academy. And they're training low-wage restaurant workers to get living wage jobs and fine dining and the general restaurant industry, including those who've been formerly incarcerated. And they're breaking the racial divide through this program. On the second floor, we have the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights Headquarters. So they'll be doing community activism and engagement with Casa Justa Just Cause. We also have the county's first spaces for restorative justice filled with light and color and texture, and they're going to be able to double their caseload. This is what the project looks like now, and we have plans to replicate it in Washington, D.C., and New Orleans, and even Detroit, for sure, for sure. So one of the last projects I'd like to talk about came out of this sort of heaviness on my heart about, you know, we're building these buildings, they take time to do, uh, and there was a lot of pain and suffering in the communities that we were working in. Uh, we were losing young people every week. Uh, in one community in San Francisco I'm working, we lost five young people to gun violence a couple weeks ago. And we really wanted to be able to find a way to serve more people and faster. And so out of that need came a, a, a mobile project, right? So from bricks and mortar to mobile called the Pop-Up Resource Village. And the Pop-Up Resource Village was really an idea about bringing resources directly to people and activating blighted sites in the community. And these are pictures from some of our, our current pop-ups we're doing. And it came out of the issue that many people could not cross turf territory. Like there was a school across the street, but they couldn't get to it. It wasn't safe. Uh, many people had no car. Uh, the infrastructure in our low-income communities of color is very bad. There's often no public infrastructure, so it's not easy to get downtown and get to these things. People weren't able to get to jobs, to doctors, to schools. And so what became a thing that we learned from the community was like there were a lot of things they just needed to be right there. And so inside of the village are people. These are the different sectors that they told us they needed, everything from health and wellness to education. And you know, I have tons of program partners that are doing this stuff. We just do this stuff. We do the things, the pieces. And this is everything from taking buses and turning them into other spaces, uh, mobile vending units, mobile site components. And so I'd like to just show you a few of what we're making. The first is a school on wheels, really in response to the very low levels of education we were seeing in the community and working with five key schools and programs who were the first people to bring GED and high school education into the county jail system in San Francisco. And so they had gotten some municipal buses and they were learning that they were losing their students when they left jail because they couldn't get to class because of all the issues I spoke about before. So we took municipal buses like these and we turned them into spaces like these. So this is the Five Keys uh, Mobile School on Wheels, and it has a library inside of it. We can seat 15 students in here and a teacher. And the goal is to, it will serve over th additional 3,000 students a year as it cross crosses communities and goes into various neighborhoods, and it will anchor the village and is anchoring the village every time we pop up. We also have a second vehicle we're doing called the Women's Resource Bus. I don't know if in your communities, you, people are releasing women from jail in the middle of the night. I, I don't know why, but they're doing it all over the state of California, and women are leaving and being going right back into the dangerous situations they were before. I, the women themselves asked for this. They wrote to the sheriff, it's like, we want to have this in our community. And so I spent a week working with these women about what kind of space they would need for a very small mobile refuge at that time of night, and also to serve them during the day in the village. And they were very specific. Everything from a caseworker, change of clothes, a, a, a little starter pack, uh, the ability to get on the internet, find out where they're going. No beds, like I thought they'd want beds. They don't want beds, but they wanted recliners, something soft to sit in. And so 
This is an image of what the space might be like for them. We've bought the vehicle. We will be in construction on that next week. And it will be there at night to receive them when they leave the jail, but it will also anchor the village and many of the women and young girls that need a variety of services on a daily basis. We will have a mobile market. <laughs> <laughs> a mobile market, mobile health and wellness, like the Kaiser mammogram truck will come. Uh, we have maker trucks coming, the San Francisco bookmobile. When we're in Oakland or Richmond, which are other cities in the Bay Area, these constellation of things all look different. We've designed to build pop-up shops for micro-entrepreneurs in the community so that when they come, they have a place to both serve and sell their goods. And really, every village gets to be different and people in the community get to decide. So I, I have a few, I promise I'm, I'm wrapping up, I have a few just last few things to sort of say that we have decided to launch a concept development fund. It's just something I wanted to share with you all because this is how we onboard new projects in the community. Uh, this is a project we're actually going to be doing with the Center for Corn Innovation, and it's a video game that helped young people de-escalate to prepare for restorative justice programming in circles. And I have a dark past doing video games as well, which I didn't talk about, but, but you know, they were peaceful ones. Uh, but this one is actually a real tool that teachers and students can use in the classroom to prepare and de-escalate. So it's a, it's a sort of self-soothing tool that we're working on. We're also realizing that a big pipeline to prison are youth transitioning out of foster care. They, one in four will end up homeless several years after leaving. 67% and more will end up incarcerated. At San Quentin Prison near us, 85% of those incarcerated have had some contact with the foster care system. We know that housing for them is critical for the success of those programs. So we're currently working with groups uh, to develop that housing using modular housing. So it's very exciting and co-develop with them so that those nonprofits also generate revenue and income from that. And finally, we're working with black churches, hopefully around the country, but primarily in Oakland, who are asset rich and cash poor to develop our first reentry campus in Oakland. And so we will be able to adaptively reuse a building that they own, because many black churches own property, but their congregations are shrinking, to co-develop and be able to serve those reentering the community in East Oakland, and then expand that into a larger campus throughout the corridor. So I always leave with this slide because I do believe Cornell West's uh, thoughts and feelings about what justice can be, not the justice I was taught about as a young person, but something that really embeds love and support and restoration. And so I hope you will join me in communicating to the world that uh, there are many, many things that we can be building together. And that as we start to implement these sort of ideas, these program ideas, um, support people really to become their best selves, that we can start to build the infrastructure that supports that. Thank you so much.